The King's Visitors I woke up early with the sound of birdsong rippling into my room, and I went straight to the little chapel. Brother John was already there, lighting the candles with a long taper. My father joined us, and he and I kneeled together by the carving of Matthew. We attended Mass and gently sang the responses to Brother John's verses. I loved Mass as much as Father did, I think. It was part of my life. Sunlight poured through the wind, went yellow and green linens over the window slits, and the smoke of the incense and the candles clouded into it and turned amber. As we prayed, I dimly heard a distant clattering sound of hooves in the lane, but my hearing must have been better than Brother John's or my father's, or else they were not disturbed by it. They kept their heads bowed, their whispered prayers shushing calmly over urgent sounds that were coming nearer, sounds that eventually alarmed me so much that my face was beading with sweat. Father, I whispered, but they both ignored me. Surely I wasn't imagining the sounds now. Raised voices, marching feet, nearer, coming nearer. And still Brother John's soft voice hummed on. Agnes Dei, qui tolis peccata mundi, miserere nobis. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world. Have mercy upon us. Suddenly the door to the chapel was flung open. My father's steward, Bailey, heaving gulps of air into his chest, stood like a wounded bear in the doorway, eyes bulging, arms flailing, swaying backwards and forwards on the balls of his feet. Soldiers have come, he gasped. My father nodded. He showed no fear or surprise except in a clenching of the muscle at the side of his jaw. He stood up, grasped my arm and hauled me down the corridor. Brother John followed, clasping the precious golden chalice in both of his hands. My father rushed us into a room at the far end of the corridor, opened the door of the passage concealed in the painted panel, and tried to push Brother John inside. The priest stood back, staring from one to the other of us. "'Go on, go on,' Father urged. "'You too will. Get in.' He shoved me through, and Brother John tumbled in after me. The door was swung to. I heard my father and Bailey pa panting as they lifted a heavy table and pushed it against the door. We were in total darkness. It was stiflingly hot and smelled of damp and the sweat of fear. I could hear Brother John's breath rattling in his throat with fright. Blind and terrified, I groped my way on all fours the whole length of the passage, which seemed now to be over the kitchens. I could smell our breakfast, fish cooking. I could hear the clattering of pots, men's raised voices, but I couldn't make out the words. Brother John didn't follow me. I could hear him whispering and knew that he was praying. We seemed to be there for hours. Perhaps we were. I had cramp in my legs and my head was throbbing. Violently, and I felt faint and sick with the heat. I was straining for sounds, any sounds. Where were the soldiers now? Had they gone? I had no idea. And at last, when I thought I couldn't bear it any longer and I was screaming inside my head for something, anything to happen, there came muffled scraping of heavy furniture being dragged and the cupboard door was pulled open. Blinding daylight scorched my eyes, and then a dark shape blocked the opening. The shape crouched into the cupboard, grabbed Brother John and hauled him out. Then the door was slammed shut, and I was in darkness again. I still daren't move. I still had no idea what was happening out there. I stretched myself out on the floor to ease my cramped legs, and must have fallen asleep. At last the door was open again. I sat up, screwing my eyes against the soft light of a candle, and heard my father calling my name. I crawled out and he put his arms out to help me to stand up. Have they gone? I asked. I was sobbing with relief at being outside that tomb. Yes, they've gone. My father's voice was breaking to pieces. They've taken Brother John. They have spared us. They told me their orders from the king were to take the priest as a lesson to us. He will hang, William. He will hang. The first time I saw a hanging, I must have been about ten years old. It's like a party, full of shouting and jeering, caps being tossed into the air, mugs of ale being passed round. If the crowd hates the victim, even if he's done, all he's done is to cut a purse from a rich man's belt, they howl at him. If they like him, even if he's a murderer, they howl at the hangman. I remember watching the hangman, wondering what his face was like under his black hood, wondering if he'd ever had to hang someone he knew. I used to dream about him at night, coming for me out of the darkness, the slits of his eyes glinting through his mask. I remember once an old woman next to me whooping and cackling as the man to be hanged was dragged to the scaffold. Oh, what a villain, she chortled. See his sweet face, full of wickedness. And that villain was a priest. I remember like Brother John. He prayed his Latin prayers in front of the scaffold. 
The crowd went absolutely silent, listening for what would be said. Do you accept that King Henry is the head of the Church of England? An official asked him. I do not, the priest said, clear, clear and calm. Do you reject the teaching of the Pope in Rome? I do not. And that set the crowd roaring and jeering again, and I couldn't take my eyes off him, that little priest with the gentle, forgiving face, and yet every bit of his body was jingling with nerves and excitement and fear and thrill and horror, all those things as the board under his feet was pulled away and he twitched and bobbed and dangled like a puppet on a string. And then he was still, so still, and would be still for ever. My father was right and I knew it. Brother John would hang, but we would be spared. Why? And for how long? Edward Loves You It was a relief to get away from Montague Hall after that awful day. I kept thinking about Brother John. I could hardly think about anything else. He was my favourite person in the world, next to my father. I missed his jokes and his riddles and his happiness. I even missed our difficult conversations in Latin. Night after night I dreamed about the hooded hangman coming to drag him to the scaffold. I woke up screaming and sweating. There was no one I could talk to about it. If I told Mother Jack, she would have filled up my head with even more frightening stories. I was afraid, too, of going back to the King's Court. He knew about Brother John. He had had him killed, but he had spared us. Why had he spared us? Did it mean he had forgiven us, or was he just biding his time? I had no idea, and every second that I spent in Hampton Court I was afraid. I couldn't trust anyone any more. I felt sure I was being watched everywhere I went, everything I did. I listened for whispers. I looked into the shadows for the hangman. But I had my work to do, and the prince and his funny little ways helped me through my nightmares. He had learned lots more words while I had been away, and he chatted all the time. He was shy of me at first, and then when he remembered me, he followed me everywhere, towing Mother Jack along behind him too, as if they were river boats and I was a royal barge. He missed you, Mother Jack said. He wouldn't even ride on his little pony without you helping him. But I couldn't send for you because of the sweat. Nobody was allowed to come here in case they brought it with them. Nobody left the place either. We have to keep the little prince out of harm's way. Oh, the scrubbing that's gone on here. Every wall, every floor. Tell me about your big world outside, William. I'm starved of gossip. But I had no stories to tell her, and now I had come back. I wasn't allowed to leave the grounds again. I felt as if I was in prison. I dreaded the thought of ever seeing the king again, but in October it was Prince Edward's second birthday. The king invited a thousand guests to Hampton Court. In they flooded, bringing all their noise with them. There were banquets and pageants for the whole week. Musicians from all over London were called in. Everyone dressed up, flirted, simpered, laughed. The king's tumblers jested and skipped and kept my prince amused. I didn't smile once, but nobody noticed or cared. I knew my Uncle Carew was watching me. I knew Lord Howard kept his eyes on me, but I just got on with my work. I didn't want King Henry to notice me at all. All I could think about was that he had caused thousands of his own subjects to be killed. He didn't care whether they lived or died, as long as they obeyed him. I had known that, and had hardly grasped it. I had been so proud of his son's page, but now he had had Brother John hanged. He had ordered his men to come to my father's house and snatch him away from us. Now I understood how cruel he was. I understood why people were so afraid of him. I never wanted to see him again, and yet I couldn't get away from him. He dominated my life. He owned me. One rainy afternoon, Mother Jack told me to take Prince Edward to watch his father playing tennis. His other servants bowed as we passed them, then followed on behind us in case they were needed for anything. I held the little boy up to the grilled window so he could see the game without being harmed by the ball. I watched the fat, gross man who thought he was chosen by God, lumbering and sweating as he played. I saw how weak he really was. He still had a stinking wound on his leg that never seemed to heal in spite of all the physicians he called in. He limped rather than swaggered these days. The nobleman who was playing tennis with him was kind to him. I could see that. He rolled the ball gently between the wall rather than slamming it, so His Majesty never had to reach out to run. But still King Henry sweated and heaved until it was clear that he was in too much pain to carry on. He kneeled down, hugging his bad leg. The wound in it gaped open, blood and yellow pus oozed from it. Servants rushed to help him and he swept them away, furious. He limped out, reeking of sweat and a sour wound. His nobles clustered round him, bowing deeply, murmuring concern. He bellowed at them for fussing over him. 
Then he saw me with Prince Edward. I kept my eyes lowered, but his majesty called out, William Carew, and I bowed to him unwillingly. He limped towards me and put his wet hand on my shoulder. Edward loves you, young William, he said. You're like a brother to him. Sometimes I wish you were his brother. All the courtiers standing round us laughed and clapped, and so did Prince Edward. I blushed and bowed my thanks. I was the king's favourite, after all. There wasn't much I could do about that. But for how long? I clenched my fists together tight, tight. I wanted to scream out loud, Let me go! Let me go! I wanted to be anywhere in the world except at Hampton Court. At last the whole glittering court took to their barges and sailed back to London. The palace sank into the swoon of exhaustion, but at least I had the freedom to ride Black Tudor again in the afternoons and to take my falcon and release her into the sky. Lucky, lucky, clever, to be able to stretch her wings as far as they could go. During one of my archery lessons, my tutor, Sir Andrew, was called away. It was a blue, bright, sharp day in late November, a day that was full of surprise sunshine before the deep winter set in. Prince Edward was chattering, waving his teething stick of coral in the air, as if he was painting the clouds, and Mother Jack was singing to him in her dreamy way. I had a little nut tree. They were both muffled up in furs against the cold. I put down my bow and arrow and waited for Sir Andrew to come back. I watched the drift of the last golden leaves from the great trees, curling and uncurling like lazy dancers on their way down to the ground. And I thought, I wish this moment could last forever. I was actually happy. Say goodbye to Prince Edward, William, Mother Jack called. He's going for his rest now. Bye, Wims, I heard the prince call. Mother Jack laughed lightly and walked away. How I wish now that I'd touched Prince Edward's little hands and smiled at him and wished him well. I crouched down by the linen clout, idly collecting up my arrows, daydreaming, and suddenly heard the sound of someone hurrying across the grass. I jumped up guiltily, thinking it would be someone coming to tell me off for laziness and disrespect. It was Sir Andrew. His face was tense and white with worry. "'William, your father needs to see you straight away,' he whispered, catching his breath. "'My father? Is he here?' "'No, he sent a messenger to fetch you. A boat is waiting at the steps.' I looked up at him, puzzled. What could be so urgent that my father would send for me? Did he have bad news of my sister? I've brought you a cloak. It will be very cold on the river when the sun goes down, Sir Andrew said. I'll walk you down to the landing steps. He glanced round to see if anyone was watching us, then he looked at me gravely. His eyes were sharp with concern. I must warn you, there, was, there are serious problems at Westminster. There is danger everywhere. Danger? What do you mean? But Sir Andrew was looking away from me. We were within earshot of the oarsman. Maybe he had already said too much. He handed me onto the boat, where my father's messenger was waiting, and then walked briskly away as if he had never spoken to me. A Palace of Whispers By the time I arrived at Palace of Westminster, I was tired and aching with cold, dizzy for food. Courtiers were moving idly about in their usual languorous way, jesting, bowing to one another, smiling and whispering. The air was brittle with tension. I felt anxious and afraid. The closer you came to King Henry, the more afraid you were. It was like being in a garden of brightly coloured chirruping birds. One clap of the, of the hands would send them squalling and fluttering away in fright. There were footsteps ahead of me and behind me, the swish of the skirts on dry rushes, flickering the candlelight. Shadows cast by the great fires, tapestries swaying. It was always like this. Someone there, someone not there. It was a palace of whispers, a palace of shadows, and that day it seemed to be the palace of nightmares. The messenger ushered me quickly to the, the room my father used as an office. My father was there on his own, pacing up and down, up and down, his hands behind his back. When he saw me, he stopped and stared at me as if he didn't know me. His face was ashen. William, William, he said. His voice was a strangled sound in his throat. He went over to the casement window and I followed him. I took off my cloak and laid it over a chair and bowed for his blessing. He put both his hands on my shoulders and when I looked up at him I saw that his eyes were bright. Too bright. I wish I hadn't sent for you, he said breathlessly. It was the wrong thing to do. What's happened, I asked. Is it Marjorie? Marjorie? No, she's safe where she is, thank God. But I should not have called you here. His hands were trembling. I could feel them through my heavy doublet. I should have taken the chance and come for you myself. We could have gone to my friend de Creasy's house. We would have been safe there for a while, perhaps. Perhaps it's it's too late now. But what's happened? I'd never seen my father like this. Not when Matthew died, not when Brother John was taken away. 
I had never seen cold fear like this in him before. We haven't much time left. I wanted to see you and to warn you myself. I was afraid to send you a message that could be used against you, but you must hear what I have to say and then go. He dropped his voice to an urgent whisper. I think my life is in danger. Shh! And listen. You know that I cannot accept King Henry as head of the church. It's against all my beliefs. I have refused to swear to the act of supremacy. This means I am accused of treason. Many have turned away from the old ways to please him, but I can't. I won't. My faith is everything to me. Nor will I, said I firmly. But why is he doing this? At first, it was because he wanted to marry Anne Boleyn, years ago when you were a little boy. Now there are rumours that he's thinking of marrying a... Lutheran from a duchy in Germany, Lady Anne of Cleves. This is up to him. Then it's nothing to do with you, I said, relieved. My father was just a secretary after all. His rank was well below any of the officials like Cromwell who dealt with such things as weddings and foreign affairs. Your uncle Carew wants to speak to me later today about this. All I can think is that His Majesty knows that I hid Brother John in my house and that I have refused to swear to the act of supremacy. Now it's my turn to be punished. His voice broke and he breathed in sharply, squeezing his eyelids together. I thought of that stifling passage behind the kitchens. I thought of Brother John whispering his prayers. I thought of the soldiers dragging him away to be hanged. Lord Howard has told him, I shouted. Percy Howard. <sighs> Shh, William. For God's sake, keep your voice down. I think Lord Carew sent the Howards to our house. He wanted them to find me praying in chapel. He wanted them to betray me. I stared at him, mystified. But why? So he can disown me. You and your sister are known as the Carews now, but I am still a Montague. If he disowns me, he can't be blamed for what I do. I might be hanged, but he will be rid of me and safe. That's what I think. He took his Montague signet ring off his finger, twisting it slightly over his knuckle, and held it out to me. Take it. Keep it, William. I shook my head, scared by his serious expression, but he pressed it into my palm and curled my fist around it. Keep it safe. Take it to my dear friend Lord de Quisi at Greenwich. He doesn't know you, but by this seal he will know our family. Go on your knees to him to beg him to help me. It's my only chance. He may now be of the same belief as the king, as most people are if they want to keep their heads, but he's my friend. He may feel moved to listen to you at least. Surely he'll help us and speak to the king to pardon you. But I can't go on my own. Come with me, please. We could leave now. I can't. They'll stop me at the gates. I should never have sent for you. I've put you in danger too. But I wanted to see you, to say goodbye. He paused for a long moment. Do this for me, William. Leave this palace now and trust to no one. I still couldn't move, couldn't believe what he was saying to me. Only the urgency in his voice told me that he was what he was saying must be true, that he had lost favour with my uncle and that this life was in danger, and mine too. But I still don't understand, I whispered. Why pick on you? My father put his hand across his face as if he could wipe away the weariness of so many sleepless nights. I don't understand either, he whispered. I don't understand why a man can't worship God in the way he has always done. And just by saying that, I am guilty of treason. I can be hanged for that, or tortured. Remember Daniel in the Bible? Remember how he was put in the lion's den because he refused to pray to every, anyone except to his God? This is what happens in our country. Only men are not thrown to the lions anymore. Monks and nuns have been known thrown onto the streets. Priests are sent to the gallows, like our dear brother John. Churchmen are incarcerated. Terrible, monstrous things are done to them. Our king is a tyrant, William. He opened the casement window and peered out as if he was searching for someone. Then he came back in to me. Why don't we go home, I said again. We could leave the court, both of us. We could try at least. Don't give up. My father's face was ice grey. There's more to tell you. It is rumoured that our chapel is burned to the ground, our house destroyed, the servants dismissed. We will have no home any more. Now do you understand how serious this is? I nodded. Tears were streaming down my cheeks, the hot blinding tears of despair. I felt as if everything I loved most in the world was being taken away from me. My home, my chapel, Matthew's statue, father, Marjorie, gone, all gone. Let me stay with you. He shook his head. He turned slightly, hearing, as I did, the sound of brisk feet marching along the corridor. Soldiers walk like that, not courtiers. If you stay here, you are in as much danger as I am. Go. His voice was hollow. Trust no one. Do this much for me, William. He pushed me towards the window, but at that moment the door began to open and Father slid, behi sl slid me behind the hanging and stood directly in front of me. Someone came quietly into the room. He stood rubbing the palms of his hands together. I knew it was my Uncle Carew. Aha, you're here, Robert. 
My father bowed stiffly, my Lord Carew. I could hear my uncle pacing towards us, and my heart was jerking in my chest. I thought I was going to faint with terror, then he stopped. For a waiting moment that lasted forever, neither of them spoke. Then, my uncle cleared his throat with a little yelping sound. <clears throat> Robert, you will have heard that with great regret my wife and I have closed down Montague Hall. My father answered quietly, I have, my lord, but I don't understand why. Oh, I think you do. My uncle was pacing round the room again now. I heard more footsteps. Someone else had come in, but I daren't look. I was willing my father to say the right words, whatever they were, the words that would save his life. I am told by reliable witnesses that you have acted against His Majesty's degrees. My uncle went on smoothly. You never attend chapel here. You continue your papist worshipping in spite of my insistence that you cease. Even, I hear, that you kept a seditious priest in your house. Is this true? His voice rose. I imagined his taut, angry face, the gold, cold glitter of his eyes. My father spoke calmly and quietly. I have acted according to my conscience, Lord Carew. Your conscience? Your conscience should tell you that you will most must be loyal to your king. Do you realise how dangerous this practice is? Do you realise that you could be hanged for this? My father kept his silence. My throat was throbbing with fear. I had no idea what to do. Then the older man spoke, and I knew at once who it was. It was the Duke of Norfolk. His brother had visited our house, eaten our food, and ridden with my father. His nephew, Percy, had played chess with me every night. Now I knew what he meant when he told me the story about our family who had kept a hangman in their house, because of Brother John, my father and I would hang. Robert Montague, he said, I hear you have refused to, act, to agree to the act of supremacy. Would you care to tell me why? There was a moment's silence. Then my father said very quietly, but quite clearly, I do not accept that King Henry is the head of the Catholic Church in England. The Pope in Rome is the head of the Holy Catholic Church. There was a deep sigh from the Duke. Then, Robert Montague, you are accused of high treason. His Majesty the King spared you once. Your priest was hanged as a lesson to you, and yet you have not learned anything, it seems. His Majesty is disappointed in you. He desires you to be detained in his prison at Newgate until such time as you repent. There was an acid smile in his voice. You know what they do to those who refuse to sign the oath of allegiance to his majesty? They are stretched on the rack, maybe, or turned on the wheel. He was slimy with pleasure. My uncle cut in quickly. A few months in Newgate should jolt you out of your foolishness if you live. Or else you can die a traitor's death by the hangman and by the sword, the Duke of Norfolk added. Take him, he barked. The door swung open, open again. Soldiers came in and marched towards what I, where I was, squashed behind the hanging. Then my father's weight lifted away from me as he stepped forward. There were footsteps leaving the room and then silence. Long, long silence when I hardly breathed or moved. At last I felt sure there was no one in the room, yet I didn't, stare, didn't dare to step out. Terrified, I hoisted myself up inch by inch onto the window ledge and somehow squeezed through the little casement opening. I rolled backwards through it and tumbled down into the shrubbery below. I froze there, not moving, not breathing. I crouched for ages longer until I could tell for sure that Uncle Carew wasn't standing at the other side of the window looking out. My limbs were trembling. I had to run, yet still I couldn't. I was paralysed with fear. I gasped for breath, as if the air had turned as thick as mud. From across the lawns, a voice called out to me. William, I can see you! I jerked my head round, terrified. It was Lady Catherine, Marjorie's friend. She ran across to me, her skirts lifted in her hands, just as she used to run across the grass at home. Are you playing hide-and-seek? she laughed. Marjorie, Marjorie, where can she be? I jumped to my feet. She held out her arms to catch me and I pushed past her, sobbing aloud. She put her hand to my, her face, surprise and alarm flitting across her eyes, and I ran away from her as I had never run before. I daren't turn my head, I daren't think. I daren't look to the right or left of me. Courtiers were strolling across the darkening lawns, as if it was just another evening, laughing and joking and teasing one another. They didn't see me. I was just a page running an errand for a night. They didn't see that I was white with fear or hear my breath tumbling in my throat. 
My father had been taken to Newgate Prison, and all they could do was laugh and flirt with one another. My father was being tried for treason. My father might die. Like a hunted deer, I ran to the gates of the palace. I lifted up my hand to show the guards the signet ring so that they would think I was on an urgent message to deliver. And then I was out in the street, homeless. I had only one thought in my head, to save my father's life. Another world. Immediately I was surrounded by beggars. They stank of sweat and filth and disease, but I had no pomander to keep the smell away. The creatures were clutching at me, thrusting out their grimy paws for coins. A woman held out her baby towards me, letting it fall miserably in my face. Its skin oozed with running sores. Let me through, I shouted, but they took no notice. I still had to force my way through their stench of sickness and dirt. A legless beggar child clung to my doublet, and I shook him off roughly. What could I do for him? I had no money. My father was going to die. I was as wretched as any of them. Leave me alone! I broke away from them and ran down a side street. They didn't follow me, but stayed in a howling bunch at the gates, like a pack of beaten dogs hungry for the next courtier to come out. The further I ran, the filthier and dingier the streets became. They were so narrow that I could almost touch the leaning houses on each side of me. The feet was... My feet were skidding in mud and horse dung. The smell of sickness was everywhere, mingling with the reek of wet chimney smoke. Pigs and rats rooted am among piles of rotting food. Hens shrieked around my feet, and everywhere I went people stared at me, a page in velvet and silk. A member of the royal household running alone and scared in their streets. If a filthy street boy had run into the king's presence chamber... He wouldn't have caused more of a stir than I did then. I paused to get my breath, and immediately a gang of men moved towards me, arms outstretched as if they were waiting a bee we uh, sorry, as if they were baiting a bear. A toothless woman cackled from her doorway. I turned round and charged down another side street, then another, through a maze of suffocating alleys, each one darker than the first. The houses leaned dangerously towards one another like rows of drunken lords about to tumble into the s into sleep. I had no breath left in my body. My legs were spent. I staggered against a wall and collapsed into the doorway of a shop. The rush lights were lit. The tiny lattice windows were filled with bottles of coloured liquids. I could just see an old man in a dark green apothecary's gown inside, carefully weighing out powders. I could hear him counting to himself. His wand of golden willow lay on the ledge next to him. At least I won't die yet if I shelter here, I thought. If the cold chills my bones to sticks, this old man should have something to make me better. I curled up against the door, hugging my knees, and thought about my chances. I might die of starvation. When the beggars or thieves find me, they'll tear me to pieces looking for a purse, and I'd no money with me anyway. I might as well be a pauper. How would I get to Greenwich? How would I find Lord de Creasy? And my father was locked in Newgate, left to rot with the rats and mice. What would happen to him? I thought of the stories of terrible tortures that Mother Jack had regaled with me. Girls crushed under boards that were piled with stones. Men stretched on racks or screwed into metal frames that twisted their bones until they cracked. My father, my father. And if he didn't agree, even then, to say the king Henry was head of the church, he could be tied to a stake and burned alive, or hanged until he was nearly dead, and then his insides cut out of him while he was still alive. All these things happened, I knew that well. At that moment, I thought my heart would break. I felt so alone, so afraid. I whispered prayers, my prayers, the Latin prayers of my childhood, over and over again like a chant. I held my father's ring up to the light from the apothecary's shop. I could see the family crest engraved into it, our ancient family beloved of the Plantagenet king, all brought to ruin by Percy Howard. I slipped the ring onto my finger, but it was too big. I would soon lose it if I kept it there. I tucked it into my purse. All I could hope was that some cut purse didn't sneak up behind me and sniff it away from my belt. I huddled into the doorway as darkness grew, and the night breathed a cold, sharp wind around me. The noises of the city died away except for the barking of dogs. Eventually I was aware of the shop door opening, and a lantern casting a flickering light across my face. I looked up to see the old man coming out backwards, pulling the door closed to lock it. He almost stumbled over me. Good heavens, what's this? He bent towards me, screwing up his eyes to look at me. A young courtier by your fine clothes, on my doorstep. Young sir, sire, get yourself up. Not safe for you here at night. 
is not safe for anyone. Are you lost? I struggled to my feet. I'm all right, I said stiffly. A bit tired, I needed a rest. The old man shook his head. The wispy hair straggling down from his cap fluffed out like down on a duckling's back. Rest in a drafty doorway when you might have a real bed in the king's palace? Is that where you belong? Let me take you to your gates. Which family are you from? They'll have set up a hut, a hunt, and cry for you if you're lost. He held out his hand, but I was too afraid to follow him. Trust no one, my father had warned. This old man might deliver me right into the hands of the king's soldiers. I backed away from him, covering my face with my hands as, they, as he held up the lantern. I darted back down the street, slipping again in the slime, and came into an open square. Maybe I was safer here, where there were people. Merchants and street talkers were making their way home for the night, dark shapes in the gloom. I was shivering with cold and hunger and fear, and I thought briefly of the court, the trestle tables, and I th bending with the weight of food and the king lounging with his new favourite lady by his side. He would be singing one of his songs, maybe, and the musicians would be fumbling at their harp and viols, keen to join in with his tune. The ladies would be dancing in the glow of the great fire, their rich gowns swishing like waves on the shore. Did anyone miss me? Why should they? The king did not even miss his dead queen. He had a son. That was all he cared about in the whole world. But did his son miss me? Why should he, I thought miserably. He's only a baby. He can't even say my name properly. Mother Jack would wonder where I had gone. But servants and courtiers often disappeared when the king turned against them. Nobody asked questions. They might be the next one to lose their head. The only person in England who would miss me was my father. The thought of my father gave me the strength to carry on. I had to do something to help him. No one else would. I kept on running away from the palace, away from the squalor of the streets, until I was too tired to lift my feet off the ground. That night I slept under the stars, and a cold night it was, and I swear the stars were shivering as much as I was. I kept thinking of my bed at Hampton Court with its thick, heavy curtains to keep away the draught, and the warm, comforting glow of the fire in the hearth. I would probably never see the inside of the palace again in my life. Already it seemed like another world. I was still terrified in case any of the soldiers who had taken my father away would come in search of me next. I had been seen coming to the palace and running away from it. I could be quite sure of that. Someone would talk. They had only to ask for a boy in courtly clothes and my way would be pointed out to them. A hue and a cry, the apothecary had said. If they wanted to, they would find me in no time and drag me off to Newgate Jail. And then what? Stretch me on a rack? Burn me? Hang me? They could do anything if the king had decided I wasn't his favourite any more. A Dead Boy's Clothes The crowing of cockerels woke me, but I have no idea how I managed to sleep. I was stiff and cold and my clothes were damp. I stretched myself and screwed my eyes up against the sharp sunlight. It must be about six of the clock, and my father had already spent a night in a filthy prison. What had they done to him by now? And when they caught me, what would they do to me? If only I still had my cloak, I could wrap it around myself and hide my rich courtier's clothes, and would have kept me warm too last night, but I had left it in my father's room, and there was no going back for it now, or ever. I stumbled on again until I came to a cluster of thatched cottages. A man with a long red beard like a squirrel's tail was whittling spoons, shaving, curling strips of wood away as if he were peeling an apple. He grinned at me, showing black stumps of teeth. A baby in a long loose gown was crawling in the dirt, picking up grain that had been scattered for hens. A woman was laying out her washing on a patch of grass, helped by a girl of about my sister's age. She looked like Marjorie, but was thin and plainly dressed. Her hair was tawny brown, knotted like a sheep's wool under her coif and she had a white heart-shaped face. A boy of my age was strapping bales of cloth onto a cart. He was whistling cheerfully, but as soon as he saw me, he stopped and nodded, staring and awkward. The woman and girl looked up, saw me and curtsied. The baby cried, and the girl picked him up so that he was tucked under her arm. She ran into one of the cottages. An old woman in a faded brown kirtle came out and dropped spindle of brown thread bouncing from her hands. She neither bowed nor curtsied, but stared at me, chewing something endlessly in her toothless gums, peering at me as if she could only just make me out. "'A young lord,' she said at last. "'What an honour. Her blue eyes were clouded with mistrust. "'Or someone very wealthy indeed. 
she chuckled over her shoulder to the shadowy depths of the cottage. I need bread and ale, I told them helplessly. You better give him some, Meg, the old woman called inside the cottage. I turned to the boy. And I need your clothes. The boy clasped his arms across his chest. My clothes, sir? Now, I must have them. I held out my arms for someone to undo the buttons and laces of my doublet. There was no way I could do it by myself. The boy was still standing, staring at me. His sister came out of the cottage and stood beside him, a jug of ale and a hunk of coarse rye bread in her hands, waiting for me to take them. Don't stare at me, I shouted. I couldn't hide my frustration any longer, but I sounded like my Aunt Carrie and I felt sorry for that. There was a time when I would never have spoken to country people like that. As if they were lower than I was, I softened my voice. I'm not robbing you. Here, see, you can have mine in exchange. Yours? In exchange for mine? I could have shaken him. Was that all he could do, stand and stare with his mouth open and his eyes bulging, repeating everything I said? Couldn't he see how desperate I was? He turned to the younger woman, half grinning, and she came flapping forward and put her arm across his soldiers. shoulders. Sorry. I flinched to see it, thinking she was going to hit him. That's what my aunt would do, at the slightest hint of disobedience. But her fingers tightened and she drew him closer to her side. She stared at me, her eyes nearly out of her head. The old woman chortled. Are you mocking us, sire? She asked scornfully. How could a poor boy dress himself in the colours of the rich? Meg, give his lordship the food and drink he's asked for, and then perhaps he'll be on his way, and we'll get on with our work. The girl blushed right into her hair, and came to me with the ale and bread, and for the moment I dropped my arms down and took the food and drink from her. I turned away and ate and drank noisily. The child's hungry, the old woman said. Take your time or you'll choke on that. She hobbled towards me, still bobbing her thread, and peered at me again. Oh, fine clothes they are, she nodded. Too fine for you, Nicholas. You wouldn't be in them in five minutes before you got robbed of them. Or put in jail as a robber and murdered yourself, or a, and a murderer yourself. You can't have them. I don't want them, the boy said. I wouldn't be right in them. All dragged away by the king's men, she added slowly. That's it. I do believe that's it. That's why you're so keen to get out of your finery, am I right, young sir? Because you could tell us in exchange for the food we've put in your belly. Because I don't expect you to in you intend to pay us. Why you want Nick's rough brown stuff so specially? And why you want him to wear your fancy colours? I said nothing to the old woman but looked helplessly down at my clothes and then back at the boy. Maybe I had to order them the way my aunt ordered the servants after all. All I knew was that I had to get rid of the court clothes. Take your shirt off now, I demanded. Take these clothes off my back. I wrenched again at the laces, trying uselessly to fling off my doublet. A pair of jackdaws came squabbling round, for me, mount round me for the breadcrumbs I'd shaken off, and I swung my arms angrily to make them flap away. Shall I tell you what I see in your eyes, young sir? The old woman said. Fear. My guess is you're running away. Would it be from the king's soldiers, am I right? Shh. She put her hand across her mouth. My lips are sealed. Whatever you've done, it's no business of mine, but you don't want to swap clothes with our young Nicholas here. Our boy is never going to dress up like a courtier and swing from the gallows for it. Oh, no. If you want common clothes that badly, come with me and I'll get you some. Come on, follow me. She moved away and then looked back. Her eyes wicked with suppressed laughter. Mind you, I do like a hanging. <laughs> I started to follow the old woman. The boy, Nicholas, was loping al along behind me, like a dog after its master. I turned to glare at him, but he returned me a friendly, honest stare. I decided that he wasn't mocking me, he might as well follow, because I trusted him more than the old dame. She hobbled and rocked as she walked, kicking hens out of the way, and paused at last outside a mean shack. In there, she jerked her head towards the open doorway of the shack. Happened last night, poor soul, but his clothes are no use to him now, and if you don't have them, some other beggar will. I has hesitated and then peered in. In the dim light, I could just make out the shape of a child lying on the earth floor. He was alone, and in that still and awful silence, I knew that he was dead. I drew my head back out again. He's the last of his, of his family to go, the, the woman said. 
a pox they had, wiped them all out in a week, one by one. Cart'll be round to collect them soon, and I tell you, his clothes are more used to you than they are to him. Have them, go on. I shook my head. I can't. I don't think I can do it. Oh, the misery of being I born, she scoffed. What you mean is, sir, you don't think you can get your own doublet and hose off. Nick, strip off that child in the cottage and cover him up with a blanket to, uh, to keep his poor dead body warm. God rest his soul, for it isn't with him any more. It's with the angels, and that's much better place to be. And you, sire, if you don't mind my grubby hands, lift your arms, and I'll tell you, uh, and I'll turn you into a rag bag. She tucked her drop spindle and thread into the girdle and unlaced my sleeves and slid them off. Then she unlaced the rest of my doublet round my waist and lifted it away from my hose. She slid my fine hose down to my feet, tapping my ankles to lift first one foot and then the other, so that she could slip off my uh, off over my leather boots and the hose. Finally, she threw my feathered cap onto the ground, untied my fine linen shirt and tugged it up over my head. I stood for a bitter, shameful moment naked in the biting wind, till Nick ran out of the shack with a bundle of rough brown rags in his hands and held them out to me. I scrambled into them myself this time, as the shirt was as loose as a night, a night smock and easy to pull over my head. I pulled up the coarse hose and flung on the jerkin, then stepped back into my own boots. I had no wish to go barefoot like the dead boy. Transformed, the old woman shrieked. Doesn't he look as plain as you and me, Nick, except for his face as clean as new washing and his hair's as soft as silk? I couldn't quite quite take to him now Now he's one of us. Good day to you, sire. She swept me a mocking curtsy. Ruff your nice hair up, sire, and put on this hat. No one will know you from any common child in London, heaven help you. She crammed my hair into the dead boy's brown wool cap and stood back to admire me. Grandmam. What will you do with his clothes now? Nick called anxiously. You won't make me wear them. Oh, I got plans for this fine cloth, she said. Our oh, Meg's as, as quick a seamstress as anyone I know. Next market day, there will be pretty little velvet purses and silk handkerchiefs for sale. And maybe a French hood or two. And they'll be snapped up by the fashionable merchants' wives at the market. You'll see. I bent down and picked up my knife and my purse and shoved them quickly into my new belt. The old woman watched me keenly. Got money in there, have you? She asked. Because if you have, you can pay for these new fashionable garments I've given you. I shook my head. No money, I said. Just a trinket of my father's to remember him by. I tried to say, but my voice shook and I, and I turned away. Lost now for what to do next. She snorted and wandered back towards her cottage. And the boy stood with his thumbs stuck in his belt, watching me. I have to go to Greenwich, I said awkwardly. How do I get there from here? Damn river, Nick said, jerking his thumb, but it will cost you. Then I'll walk, I said. I'll come with you if you like. I stopped and stared at him. You're dressed like a poor boy, but you don't stand nor speak nor act like a poor boy, he said. You'll get yourself into trouble in no time. I turned away and began to walk off. I can manage. Let me come too. I can help you if you want. I turned round, sure that he was making fun of me. You mean like a servant, I asked. Nick's eyes shone. Me? A rich boy's servant? That would be a laugh. Then I don't know what you want, I said. He shrugged. Nothing. It'd be like an adventure, that's all. I can't pay you, if that's what you mean. I know you can't pay me. I don't want pay. I just want to come with you. I gazed round me, not knowing what to say. I was loose in the city, like a sheep that's got away from its flock and it lost its way. I had no idea what to do or where to go. My servants did everything for me. If you are in trouble, he said, and the king's soldiers or the constables are after you, then you should be lie low for a day. And if you're with another boy, they'll be put off the scent, won't they? Come back to my cottage, he said. Don't mind grandmam. She talks rough and acts rougher, but her heart's big and kind. Everybody round here knows her. She's widow Susan. She's looked after us since my mother died last year. She births the babies and washes the corpses. She mends the sick and she minds the poor. And there isn't a living soul... She doesn't shout at. Stay with us till you find your way again. I nodded dumbly, not chancing myself to speak. I would rather sleep in their cottage than under the frosty stars again, that was for sure. Nick was right. I needed to hide from the king's soldiers if they were out looking for me. And it would give me time to work out how to get to Greenwich and Lord de Creasy. 
the man who would save my father. The Straw Dragon I spent the rest of the day watching Nick as he collected bits of fallen wood from the edge of a nearby forest and chopped it up for firewood. I'm allowed to take this much and no more, he told me. Just enough to fill my cart, which is why I press it down as flat as I can. He scooped up a load and spread it out, grunting with the effort. It's hard work, this. Makes you nice and warm, though. I'll say that for it. Have a go. I shook my head and put my hands behind my back. At home, it was Ned Porritt's job to chop wood when he wasn't seeing to the horses. I used to try and help him when I was much smaller and he would bend over me cross-eyed with concern if I got a splinter in my hand. But Aunt Carew had forbidden me ever to do the work of the servants. Nick didn't seem to mind that I didn't help him. He chatted away to me non-stop, pausing every now and again to wipe the sweat from his face with the hem of his shirt. At last he had finished with chopping. He piled the firewood up onto a cart and took it round to the neighbouring cottages. The woman there gave him cheeses or apples in exchange for an armful of kindling. Grandmam will be glad of these, he said. She'll store some of them up in the loft, and if we don't eat them all before we get home. Here, have some of this. He bit into an apple, sucking back the drool of juice on his lips, and offered it to me. I shook my head. I didn't want to be here doing any of this. I wanted to be on my way to Lord de Creasy's, but it was nearly dark already. I had no idea what to do or where to go, so I trailed after Nick, and when... One of the cottage women shouted at me to help her carry a load of wood in. I turned away, my face burning, and ignored her. He's sick, Nick explained cheerfully. Grandmam's looking after him. The woman peered at me. Doesn't look, doesn't look too sick to me, she muttered. Looks well fed enough anyway. It's his head that's sick, Nick said. He's pining. He didn't, we didn't go back to Nick's cottage until evening, and my feet were sore with trudging after him and my head was sore with his prattling. I wanted to be on my way to Greenwich straight away now, but he kept saying, Tomorrow, tomorrow, you're learning to be a common boy, and I'm thinking how to help, sire. I had to believe him. I was too afraid now to go anywhere on my own. If the king's men had gone to Hampton Court, they would know I was missing. There would be a search on for me. I was sure of that. I might still be recognised even in my poor boy's clothes. Maybe it was better after all to lie low for a day, as Nick suggested. But it was a long day and the afternoon had brought sharp rain that soon dribbled through the thin shirt I was wearing and dripped through my cap and over my face. I was glad when Nick's cart was empty of firewood at last. Dan, he said, wiping his dirty hands on his shirt. Come home with me for a bowl of Grandma's stew and welcome, sire. Nick's cottage was dark and draughty till he got a good fire going in the middle of the room. The house filled with choking smoke at first, sparks flew and sputtered and then settled down, and the room filled with sweet smell of burning applewood and pine cones. Cover the windows now, Grandma Susan called out. Keep the wet wind outside where it belongs. The flaps of rags were pulled down and then it was a cosy enough place and made me think of the hall at home, though it was so much smaller and didn't have the big wooden hangings, sorry, woollen hangings to keep the draughts away. Gradually shapes loomed out of the, out of the shadows. The flickering light from the fire showed the contents of the room clearly now. At one end, the milk cow munched thoughtfully, and around her in the straw and perched up on the beams of half a dozen scraggy hens crooned to themselves. At our end, there was a table and three stools, a box chair, a chest, and a straw mattress pushed against the dresser by the wall. A wooden ladder led up to the sleeping area, which was like an open-ended shelf jutting out over the cow's half of the room. The woman who had been laying out the washing that morning with Meg wasn't their mother, as I'd, first, as I'd thought at first. Nick told me she was Sarah Downey and lived nearby in one of the other cottages. She sat by the fire with us, feeding Nick's baby brother, Arthur. He gave quick, satisfying gasps as he sucked, and she hummed quietly to him. She never took her eyes off me. Yet she wasn't looking at me, not properly. She looked as if she was dreaming awake. Widow Susan placed a big cooking pot on some stones in the middle of the fire, and after a time some liquid inside it began to bubble. She threw in some bones that had a few knobs of meat on them, and a handful of vegetables that she and Meg had been chopping. Onion next, she muttered, some parsley, and a bit of tasty lovage for flavour. Some oats to thicken, and we'll eat well tonight. She grinned across at me, showing her wet, bare gums. You don't eat as well as this where you've come from, I'll be bound. Well... When we've been hunting, we have plenty of meat, I told her, shocked that she should think I was used to such poor food. 
venison in plenty and there's always good roast beef and plenty of carp and salmon. My voice tailed off. I saw that she was laughing at me. What else? Meg asked dreamily. How I should like to eat that. Her grandmother chortled again. They have so much to eat their bellies can't take it. That's what I've heard from the kitchen boy I met of, uh, from one of the big mansions. They eat so much it makes them vomit. Sometimes, I said, and felt uncomfortable now. Some people do. She clicked her tongue. While most of England starves, she spat in the fire. Shame on them. Shame on all them lords and ladies. I ate them all. Go on, Meg smiled at me. Do they eat sweet things too? I nodded. Apricots and figs and honey cakes and sometimes sugar shapes. Sometimes a whole meal is... Made of sugar shapes. Made to look like swans or castles or ships. Piles with cherries and apricots. Mmm, she sighed. You should taste my peas pudding. And wet suckets. Then you'd know good food, the grandmother muttered. You'll want nothing better than that. Our king would grow fat on that and not want for anything else. He's fat already, Nick giggled. When he steps into his barge, they say it rocks like a cradle. It will tip up one day. I was shocked. We would never even whisper such a thing in court. That's treason, I told him. It's true, though. Nick giggled again, and Meg laughed with him. And then the old grandmother put in her coarse belly laugh, too. Sarah Downey looked from one to another of them and then back at me. I was still uncomfortable. I glanced round, half expecting to see people in the shadows, dangerous, listening lords of court. I ducked my head and allowed myself a quick smile. We were sitting on the stools, pulled up so close round the fire that my legs and face felt scorching hot. Behind Widow Susan I could see an old dresser looming into shape out of the shadows. There was another black cooking pot on it, and some wooden bowls and cups and a few spoons. Piled up next to it was an interesting heap of objects, and on top of them all a strange staring head with large holes for eyes. I couldn't make it out properly in the restless flickering of the firelight, but it intrigued me. My eyes kept flicking back to it. What's that? What's that? I asked at last. Nick jumped and picked up the head. It's my dragon, he said. I made him myself out of the rushes and straw, and I'll wear him myself for the mummer's play at Christmas. What do you think of him? He took off his cap and pulled the straw dragon's head on over his face and then he picked up the bundle of rushes and shook it out. It became a full-length cape of green and sand and amber colours, crinkling and rustling like the reeds on a riverbed. He slipped it over his shirt and began to dance, thrusting his head and arms out and hissing in a scary way. Meg clapped and her grandmother chuckled. There now, a bit of cheer for the, for the young lord. Fetch you your good man, Sarah Downey, and Buttons the Fletcher at the, at the corner house. I've good ale for them if they'll come and play for us. Sarah passed the baby to Meg and ran out. A few minutes later, she came back with the man I'd seen carving wooden spoons outside the cottage next door. He grinned at me again, and I ducked my head. I wasn't used to that, grinning so you showed all your teeth like a ploughboy in the fields. No one did that in court. I was used to simpering. Another man was tight, with tight hair like blackberries, stooped in carrying a fiddle, and his wife followed him. Now the little room was crowded. Meg passed round jugs of ale, and Nick put his dragon's head back on. Jack Downey pulled a carved wooden flute from his belt, and half of it disappeared into a red bush of his beard, as he put it into his mouth and began to play a live jig on it. I knew the tune, The Merry Haymaker. In our old Montague Hall, we used to dance to it at harvest time, when all the peasants... would be brought home for a feast, and the music played all night. The rafters would be hung with sweet-smelling apples and they would bob and swing with the dancing. Long ago, before our world went grey. The Fletcher picked up his fiddle and held it against his chest, bowing it briskly so uh, it let out a yowl like a cat. Then he turned towards Jack and danced his fingers along the neck of the fiddle, making it sing the same tune as the wooden flute, and then changed his tune to a harmony. They smiled with their eyes at each other as they played because they knew all the old tunes and loved to make music together. The Seven Joys of Mary they played, and I knew the dance for it um, would be stripping the willow. Clap, 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 went the women, and the Fletcher's wife began to dance and caught Meg's hands to make her dance too. Their skirts swirled, sweeping the grasses on the floor into dusty piles, puffering the smoke from the fire into dancing ghosts. I even found myself shifting my feet from side to side in time to the music. I was back in the hall. Matthew was whooping and clapping and laughing with all the farm workers. My mother and father were swinging round together. 
My sister's eyes were bright with fun and pleasure as she watched and jigged from foot to foot, and Ned Porritch was standing proud next to his father, pumping a pair of bagpipes under his arm. But my dream dissolved, and I was standing cold and lonely among strangers. I longed for it all to be over. All I wanted was to be on my way to Greenwich to tell Lord de Creasy about my father.